Good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, Guten Morgen. Thank you for asking Kaufer to participate in this panel and speak on the public health perspective on decriminalization or legalization of marijuana. I guess I can summarize in one sentence. Proceed with an abundance of caution. Given the significant adverse effects of cannabis smoking on health, on social and occupational functioning, and especially so among the youth. Even the Dutch have been pulling back from some of their liberalized approaches with respect to marijuana. We already have two major legal substances of abuse, alcohol and tobacco, which cause a tremendous amount of harm. In the case of the latter, it's harmful when used as directed and it's all its forms, hence the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. But first, let's define some terms. There are perhaps three general policy perspectives concerning marijuana, prohibition, decriminalization, and legalization. Prohibition describes the current US federal policy and that of many countries towards marijuana use, which classifies marijuana as a Schedule I drug with a high potential for abuse and with strong legal sanctions and aggressive interdiction of supply routes. Some US states have taken a less restrictive approach. Decriminalization refers to the elimination, reduction, and or non-enforcement of penalties for sale, purchase, or possession of marijuana, although such activities remain illegal and advertising would be banned. Legalization, one step beyond decriminalization, would fundamentally change the status of marijuana in society and allow possession, sale, and advertising. No country in the world has actually done that. Overall, we can see many different types of scientific studies demonstrate significant adverse effects of cannabis smoking on physical and on mental health, as well as its interference with social and occupational functioning. These negative data far outweigh the few documented benefits for a limited set of medical indications for which safe and effective alternative treatments are already available. If there is a medical role for cannabinoid drugs, it lies with chemically defined compounds, not with the unprocessed cannabis plant. I'll say more on this in a moment, as Carfa recently conducted a review at the request of CARICOM on the therapeutic uses of cannabis. But legalization or medical use of smoked cannabis is likely to impose significant public health risks, including an increased risk of schizophrenia, psychosis, and other forms of substance use disorders. As decriminalization is considered, I must draw attention to some of the significant neurological, cognitive, behavioral, and physical consequences of short and long-term marijuana use, which are well known. These include negative effects on short-term memory, concentration, attention span, motivation, and problem solving, which clearly interfere with learning. There are adverse effects on coordination, judgment, reaction time, and tracking ability, which contribute to unintentional deaths and injuries among adolescents, especially those associated with motor vehicles. And there are negative health effects with repeated use, similar to effects seen with smoking tobacco. Three recent studies demonstrate an association between marijuana use and subsequent development of mental health problems. People sometimes say smoking marijuana is not addictive because the withdrawal symptoms are not pronounced. But it's interesting that a high percentage of regular users in a recent study also say they would like to reduce or stop because they realize it's harming them, but they can't, or they feel guilty about the amount they're using. These are classical signs of addiction. You know, with respect to substance abuse, it's interesting how people seem to live in cycles with one generation having to relearn the experiences of previous ones. Did you know when King James of England, 500 years ago, realized the damage that tobacco caused, he deemed it a nasty habit, and his initial inclination was to bat it outright. Then he was persuaded it could be regulated, sold, and taxed to raise additional revenues, which he did, and smoking places were designated. Today, with hindsight, we realize the overall socioeconomic impact of tobacco is a negative one. There's an old saying where there's smoke, there's fire. 
important perspectives on how changing the status of marijuana could affect use by youth can perhaps be gleaned by examining the U.S. experience. During the 19th century, opium use was common, especially among middle-class white women. Use of morphine was extensive, and heroin was marketed as a sedative for cough. Cocaine was routinely added to medicines and beverages. It was also legal. It was prized for its local anesthetic effect. The national opiate addiction problem in the U.S. increased more than fivefold between 1840 to the 1890s, thereafter beginning to decline once they realized the size of the problem. If we focus on young people for a moment, the latest data on drug use among secondary school students in 12 Caribbean countries has been published by the Inter-American Observatory on Drugs. The report was launched in Port of Spain in 2012, offering a comprehensive regional analysis of drug use in this group. The findings demonstrate that the dimensions of drug use are quite unique to each country. Alcohol and marijuana are the main drugs of use. Patterns vary widely from country to country, but compared to other regions, the prevalence of marijuana use in the school population in the Caribbean is high, and in some countries, higher than that of tobacco use. Other recent studies concerning American adolescents and the Dutch experience with decriminalization and the relationship between cheap marijuana and use by adolescents suggest that decriminalization increases marijuana use by adolescents, although not all studies come to this conclusion. Legalization of marijuana could decrease adolescent perception of risk of use and increase exposure. Furthermore, data concerning adolescent use of the two drugs that are legal for adults, that is alcohol and tobacco, strongly suggest that legalization of marijuana would have a negative effect on youth. Alcohol and tobacco are the drugs most widely abused by adolescents, although their sale is illegal. Research demonstrates that manufacturers of alcohol and tobacco market their products to young people. If marijuana were legalized, restriction on the sale and advertising of the substance to young people would prove daunting. Finally, Two in-depth reviews of medical marijuana conclude that future research should focus on medical use of cannabinoids, not smoked marijuana. As mentioned earlier, Koffer did a review of the therapeutic uses of marijuana by studying systematically reviews on the subject. The use of cannabis or its constituents in medicine is keenly debated. Koffer's extensive review of the literature found that clinical effectiveness was positively established for synthetic cannabinoids for the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in people with cancer, synthetic cannabinoids for treatment of acute and chronic pain, and synthetic cannabinoids and extracts from the cannabis plant for treatment of spasticity in patients with multiple sclerosis. I stress synthetic cannabinoids are not smoked marijuana, which actually delivers far more tar to your lungs than tobacco. There were negative findings. There was no clinical impact on treating dementia or motor neuron disease. And we found knowledge gaps on several fronts where there needs to be more research in regard to treatment of asthma as an appetite stimulant for cystic fibrosis, as an appetite stimulant for the anorexia induced by HIV and AIDS, for glaucoma, and for epilepsy. Note that no evidence of clinical effectiveness of smoked marijuana for treating any disease condition is due to several reasons. The available systematic review studies may not have evaluated smoked marijuana. And when this route of administration was under consideration due to study design issues, the available clinical trials did not meet the criteria for inclusion in our reviews. Lack of evidence, however, does not unequivocally mean lack of effect. Several cannabis medications have been approved and registered for use in some countries these include Marinol for use in the treatment of HIV AIDS anorexia, Canasol for the treatment of intraocular pressure associated with late stage glaucoma, and Asmosol for the relief of asthma and allergy symptoms. Two other comprehensive reviews evaluating the scientific basis for the therapeutic use of marijuana have been published recently, one by the Institute of Medicine and the other by the American Medical Association. Both acknowledged the lack of rigorous data to support the use of smoked marijuana as medicine, while calling for additional research into the medical use of cannabinoids, especially those that can be delivered rapidly in a smoke-free manner. 
The IOM report noted that marijuana smoke delivers harmful substances as well as tetrahydrocannabinol to the body and that marijuana plants cannot be expected to provide a precisely defined drug effect. For these reasons, the IOM report concluded there is very little future in smoked marijuana as a medically approved medication. If there is any future in cannabinoid development, it lies with agents of more certain, not less certain, composition. Now, having said all of the above, I can also see the negative societal effects being caused by jailing thousands of young people, especially young men, for using marijuana, from which they get a criminal record and can face longer-term employment difficulties. But the health consequences are such that any decision to decriminalize possession would be a policy one, a political one. We can only put forward the medical and public health evidence. And from a public health point of view, I repeat what I said at the beginning. Proceed with an abundance of caution, given the significant adverse effects of cannabis smoking on health and on social and occupational functioning, and especially so among young people. Thank you.